beautiful music this morning. Praise the Lord for the ability to appreciate. Jesus, who 
in his name we understand the full message of the gospel. We pray, God, that as we consider this text this morning, that you will cause us to grow in our understanding of our own faith and lead us to understand what it means to share the gospel message with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In this message, I have it entitled, True Believers, as we look at the book of Acts, chapter 19. We're looking at the first part of this chapter, and uh, the remainder of the chapter falls out as a consequence of the first part of the chapter. But we're talking about true believers, and uh, as we have alluded to the hymn that we just sang before we get into this message, the good old familiar Gaither tune, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Now I understand the expression. It's an expression that says there's something of wonderment. There's some things about it that maybe we can't explain, but it's so wonderful. And it is powerful. And as we get into the text this morning, we're going to find some Jewish exorcists that thought that the name of Jesus was powerful, and they discovered just how powerful that name was. But to begin with, we come up against a circumstance in which Apollos, we had met Apollos in the previous chapters, Apollos had preached in Ephesus back in chapter 18, but Apollos was preaching, as we find out in this chapter in verse 25, that he was not preaching a full message. Why is that not looking like the right reference that I'm looking for? Chapter 18, 25. Chapter 18 and verse 25. Thank you. Apollos was preaching. Apollos was a diligent, accurate preacher. He was instructed in the way of the Lord and fervent in the spirit, but he was preaching and teaching these things of the Lord, but knowing only the baptism of John. He had met Aquila and Priscilla, who had helped him understand more completely about faith in Jesus Christ. And then Apollos moved on. And now Paul comes to Ephesus, and he finds some disciples who were not fully up to date on the full message of the gospel. He found some disciples, and so what we're going to look at to begin with is we're going to look at a group of disciples that had repentance without faith. And I'm wondering if you would challenge your mind to think for a moment what is it like to have repentance without faith? And is that even possible, to have true repentance without faith? In the first few verses of Acts chapter 19, we come across in verses 3 and 4, Paul's description of their baptism. When Paul asks the believers... You were baptized. What do you believe by your baptism? And specifically, unto what then were you baptized if you haven't heard about the Holy Ghost? And they said that they quoted the baptism of John. Just as was written back in chapter 18, verse 25, Apollos, who had preached in Ephesus, knew only the baptism of John until Aquila and Priscilla were able to take him aside and, and show him more completely the full gospel message of Jesus Christ. But evidently, in the process, Apollos had left behind him some believers in the message that he had preached while he was preaching a message that knew only the baptism of John. Paul comes across some who are following John's baptism. 
as we recognize in verse 4 what John's baptism really is. Was John's baptism the same type of baptism that we exercise today in the New Testament Christian church? Paul describes to us what happened at John's baptism. Paul describes in verse 4, John barely, oh yes, he did baptize, and quite truthfully, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. A baptism of repentance. Here's the repentance factor. The baptism of John includes repentance toward God. But somehow that message and the baptism of John being repentance toward God does not include the reference to Jesus Christ. Because it is quoted to us what John was saying in his baptism of people. He was saying to the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. Yes, they mentioned Jesus Christ. Paul said that Jesus Christ is coming. There's a man coming after me of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. John says we should be looking forward to when this Jesus Christ, the Messiah, comes as the Lamb to take away the sin of the world. That's what John's baptism was. They had a repentance toward God. But they were still looking for the coming Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There's another reference I want to pick up on, and that is the word disciple. These were disciples when, when Paul came into Corinth he found certain disciples at the end of verse 1. This word disciples does not mean the same thing as a believer. Jesus had many disciples. Disciples are, are followers, kind of like the concept of following a particular name or subject on Facebook or Twitter. I remember a time when there was a school bus had gotten stuck on the hill beside where we lived in Ammon, New Brunswick, near Moncton. And we get a text message from our son, Rob, who was not living with us. He was somewhere else at the time. And he said, what about, what's up with that accident that's up your hill? Can you see what's going on? It's like, what? I didn't even know there was an accident. I'm the one that lives there. I don't know where he was, but he was following something of a subject, and it gave him information about an accident of a school bus on a hill. You can follow different people. Some people follow Paul Harvey, on, for example, on the radio. When, a, when Paul Harvey comes on at a certain time of a certain day, and you happen to be available, and you have so appreciated Paul Harvey, you just have to turn on the radio and listen to Paul Harvey, because number one, you like the accent in his voice. Number two, you like the way he attacks the the circumstances of, of something so simple but starting with a way that you would never understand. You like what he says. And you follow him, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you believe everything that he said. I don't know why we wouldn't believe everything that he says. I really don't think he would lead anybody astray. But let's change Paul Harvey to a radio preacher that you don't know and who is supposedly preaching the truth. There are certain men who preach on the radio that have interesting sounding accents in their voice, and I love listening to people with different accents. Uh, it helps me stay awake when they're speaking. Maybe if I try a different accent, it would help you stay awake. And maybe that would help keep the sermon going better. But when you hear these types of accents, it, en it enamors you to the speaker, perhaps. <clears throat> That's why I don't try it. But then you start following him because you like what he says and how he says it. But it doesn't mean that you necessarily believe everything he says. And sometimes we find ourselves following certain people that we realize later we shouldn't be following or necessarily putting much stock in. And I will specifically stay away from any political reference, which by a simple reference at that point, tells you that there are those who 
follow in the world a very significant following, and sometimes that doesn't always go in the right direction. There is a following without necessarily fully believing and being committed to the one that you're following. Facebook friends, you can follow your Facebook friends and you can get all kinds of updates on what your friends are doing, and even many of which, uh, if we had the opportunity to influence them, we would certainly have influenced them in a different direction. Um, being a follower is what we get from the word disciple. There were those who were followers of John's baptism. They may have been followers of the concept of looking for this Messiah, but they were not believers as many of the disciples that followed Jesus ended up leaving following Jesus when the following became difficult. So we have disciples here who were followers who were not necessarily believers in Jesus Christ because, number one, they had not even been taught about Jesus dying and being raised again. According to the message, they knew only the baptism of John. And so it is significant when Paul comes to them and talks to them about the, the Holy Spirit and the the fact that they have the, the Holy Spirit because Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. And they describe to them, they, the people, the believers, the, the disciples explain to Paul. And Paul explains to the disciples that they need to know about the Holy Spirit. They need to be fully informed. They need to be fully up to date on the message of Jesus Christ. And then we get the concept that they were baptized as believers, not just <laughs> followers. I would equate John's baptism to being a baptism of followers, those who were committed to following Christ. But the baptism that includes the Holy Spirit is one of being fully committed to Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And that is the full message that believers today need to know. But there's one more thing that we get out of this. And that is the Holy Spirit knows. And in this case, while we were still in the age of the writing of the New Testament, Paul had taught them, they accepted the concept of the resurrected Christ, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then the Holy Ghost comes on them and signifies by his presence that they were in fact believers in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit knows whether we are believers or still only disciples. Now I would like to think that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, I am a follower of Christ, I follow everything, I listen to everything he says, but not only am I a disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm also a believer in Jesus Christ, being committed to the message of his death, burial, and resurrection, and his taking away my sin. See, repentance <coughs> towards God can only bring about the half of the coin. There is a reference to faith that must go with our repentance, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but it is possible to have a repentance without having faith. It is possible to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, but not fully accept the message of his resurrection, and thus we are not believers but only followers. So while it is possible to have repentance without faith, it is also possible to have faith without repentance. As we go into the next few verses, we recognize what happened with these evil spirits. Verse 13, we have these itinerant Jewish exorcists. They were the ones who were going around and recognizing what Paul and his disciples, what Paul and his, his men were doing. <coughs> 
laying hands on people, the Holy Ghost coming on people, and uh, casting out demons by laying hands on people. And so these Jewish exorcists, vagabond Jews, they were the itinerants running around from place to place, and they recognized what Paul was doing, and they took it upon themselves to use the same name, recognizing there's power in the name of Jesus, and in the process of taking the power in the name of Jesus, he, they tried to do for themselves what Paul had been doing in terms of casting out devils. They tried to duplicate the apostolic signs, but they were defeated, as we saw in verse 16, and they, the, the response of the evil spirit was that he knew Jesus and he knew Paul. But he obviously did not know these Jewish exorcists, which, as we take from reference, were not believers in Jesus Christ. They were just Jews. Maybe they were part of those who were followers of what Jesus said without acknowledging the resurrection, without acknowledging the power and the death of Christ and taking away their sin. They had a they faith, perhaps. They believed that Jesus' name was powerful. And they believed that they could do something with Jesus' name and cause the same effect as the Apostle Paul, and they were obviously well misled and wrong. But I get another implication out of this too, and that is that these evil spirits, these evil spirits also know whether we are believers or still only disciples. Verse 15, the believers knew the difference between Paul and these men who did not believe in Christ. Even the evil spirits can determine the difference between believers and non-believers. So how do we, how do we know the difference between a true believer and one who is either, they have a faith, in Jesus Christ, but they don't have any repentance. They have a faith in believing that, that Jesus Christ can save them from their sins, but they haven't actually repented from their sins. Now, there are many I have met that recognize and believe that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for their sin and was resurrected, and they have not yielded their life to it. They say they believe it, but they don't live it. And as far as we're concerned, it's hard to know whether they even made that uh, decision, whether it was a decision of faith or not. But if it doesn't have the repentance along with it, that's something that we recognize is either missing or yet to come or needs to take place. As we look at verses 18 through 20, I wanted to make just a simple comment on what we read there. The many who had faith in God recognized and believed in Jesus Christ. When faith and repentance came together, it was obvious. The many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. This is their repentance. This was such a turning away from what they had been doing that they actually brought their magic books, all of their books that had all of these magic potions, uh, different weird words of saying things, and the curious arts that they had been practicing, they brought them together and burned them and found a very significant economic impact by finding the value to be about 50,000 pieces of silver. The only way I have to reconcile with that is the concept that a slave sold for 30 pieces of silver. One slave, 30 pieces of silver, and here's a pile of books worth 50,000 pieces of silver. That is significant. And what that tells me is that when someone has a faith in Jesus Christ and they recognize the need for repentance from sin and to following Jesus Christ, they are changed. They turn away from what was their life in the past that was so much against God's word. 
And so we have the concept that faith requires repentance, and repentance requires faith because they are, in fact, both opposite sides of the same coin. Acts chapter 20, when we get there, we'll get there into uh, next week, I hope. Acts chapter 20 and verse 21 has Paul testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a reference to both repentance and faith together. Repentance toward God is that concept that John was preaching at his baptism. Repentance toward God also has to be combined with faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 says much the same thing. I'd like to read that as well as we come to our conclusion here. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 having just gone through a description of many of the basic concepts of the faith, is now coming to a point of wanting to get into deeper doctrine. And so, in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, he starts out with, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. That doesn't mean let, letting go of them. That means having already established the doctrines of Christ, for the doctrine of Christ. They want to go on to perfection. And then he makes reference to these initial principles of the doctrine of Christ. The laying, again, the foundation of repentance from dead works. There is the repentance and the faith that follows is faith toward God. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God go hand in hand. These are part of the simple, basic doctrine of Jesus Christ. And so we recognize that the Holy Spirit knows the difference, the evil spirits knows the difference, but we've also found out that faith plus repentance yields a true change, and this is how we as human beings may be able to know and demonstrate to one another that we are true believers, and that is that there is a change in our lives that uh, sets aside that which used to be against God's word. And when we find ourselves in a position of sinning yet again as we face occasions, which often we do, we recognize our repentance once again comes to the Trying to, I'm trying to lead into 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we do have a sin that comes up in our lives, we find ourselves coming to the throne of grace. When we come to the throne of grace because we need help, remember, what do you find first when you come to the throne of grace? We find mercy. Mercy that covers our sin. And then we find grace to help in a time of need. We cannot have repentance without faith in Christ. We cannot have faith in God without repentance towards what the scriptures tell us that we need. We must have faith and repentance together. And with that, we simply ask the question of you whether you are here in our service this morning or whether you are uh, observing this by our YouTube channel. Are you a true believer? Or could it be said that you may be one who has a, a faith in God but have not yielded to the repentance required? Or perhaps you have repented many times knowing that repentance is necessary, but have never expressed a true faith in Jesus Christ. If this raises questions for you, please ask me about it. Tell me what your questions are, and then we can more fully answer these questions and perhaps <coughs> even identify a spiritual need that may need to be reconciled with God. I'd be happy to do that.
either speak to me after the service or contact me through the, the web page, AugustaBaptist.org, and uh, there are means of contacting there. Find the telephone number there. And uh, let's get this issue settled if there's any question. Are you a true believer? And then also, as you have opportunity to uh, witness to others, understand that there is a concept of faith, there is a concept of repentance, and they both have to come together. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to review these, these examples of faith and examples of repentance, and we recognize, God, that they must go together. We thank you that you have given us your word, that we can understand these things. And I pray that you will help each one of us to appropriate what we have learned, to take what we know, and to exercise the faith, and to exercise the repentance as we need to. And we pray that you would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.